Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Welcome everybody to today's meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee. We are meeting by authority of the legislature and the governor. It's extended our ability to meet via electronic Zoom virtual meetings through March of next year. Uh, it's nice to see you all. I'm gonna ask you to signify your presence vocally. Sharon? Here. Christine? Here. Paul? Present. George? Here. Um, Alex? Here. And Austin is here. And uh, we may, I hope, be joined by other members of the committee, but we have a, um, we have a quorum at present. Uh, I see Sean. Sean, can you hear us? Sean? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry. Great. Just okay. Fa fabulous. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, the first item of business is the approval of minutes from July 5th. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Paul. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Thank you, George. Okay, are there any comments, corrections to the minutes from July 5th? When did we get an email with them? Uh, I don't know that you got an email with them. The uh, uh, minutes were in the packet that was posted on the town website. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're in the packet there. I'm under the minutes part, so I'll look there. Um, I would have looked at them on. They're in the packet uh, uh, that was posted for this meeting. Okay, any, anything else on the minutes? Anything on the minutes? Okay, Sharon, uh, vote to approve. Yes, yes. or no? Yes. Chris, Christine? Yeah, I approve. Thank you, George. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Yes. Uh, Sean. Yes. Alex. Yes. And Austin votes. Um, Austin votes yes. The agenda as posted listed minutes from July 26. Those minutes are not available. Okay. Um, I. I wonder if it would make sense, Sean, before going to the financial update, to actually um, ask Craig to make his presentation. So if there's no objection, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask Craig, and thank you to Craig and Will for joining us. Thank you for Josephine and Ellen from FAA for joining us. I think what we ought to do next is to hear from Craig about the, um, cost estimation activity, the exercise, and what it, um, and what it produced. So Craig, would you uh, please uh, lead us through uh, your presentation? Absolutely. Um, let me share my screen. Thank you. Okay, should be able to see that now. So um, in short, uh, the news that I have to deliver is frankly not very good. Um, we did complete the cost estimate reconciliation and um, in short found things are more expensive now than before and even that even more than we anticipated. Um, so this presentation, the idea is to sort of take a step back, um, help everyone understand sort of like where we've been um, so that you guys can uh, hopefully make an informed decision on where to go next. Um, at any point, if something I say doesn't make sense, feel free to stop me. Um, and then I can share this um, presentation with Angela so she can post it after. Um, right. All right. So what we're going to go through is just sort of high level sort of budgets and costs. Um, you know what that means. Um, the cost estimate sort of I'll give you a quick explanation of the process we went through and then the outcomes. Uh, there is a budget gap. So we'll talk about that. There are a couple of paths forward um, and there may be others that are not identified in this, but I'll, I'll share with you what we've got so far, the challenges, limitations to each of those, and then how it all affects uh, the schedule or timeline. So big picture um, projects, construction projects are broken down into two big buckets, hard costs and soft costs. 
So the hard costs are everything you need for the building and the site. So that's like your construction. Uh, soft costs are your furnishings, professional fees, any expenses, um, your contingencies. Uh, and together, hard costs plus soft costs is our total project costs. And you could say the same thing about our budget. You know, hard, you know, the, the budget for the hard costs plus the budget for the soft costs equals our total project budget. Um, so this is where we were with the budget, which is um, how much money uh, is available. And that is uh, the budget for the hard costs was at this, let's say 27 million. Budget for the soft costs, uh, just over 9 million. And then total project budget, so that's how much money it's set aside, 36.3 million. Um, just to give maybe the folks at home um, an understanding of where that money is coming from, MBLC is their grant is for 13.9 million. Uh, Library Capital Campaign is uh, targeting $6.6 .6 million in fundraising. Uh, Town of Amherst is contributing uh, $15.8 million. And so the total amount of money that is available matched the budget. So those two aligned. Previous cost estimates. And now a cost estimate is just the hard costs, just the construction <coughs> costs. Um, so if I back up, so that'd be just this, this number here, this 26.9 million. So back in uh, summer of 2020, those projections were for 25.2 million, seemed good. Uh, flash forward two years, April 2022, that number jumped up, as we know, jumped up to 30.8 million. This number does include the um, anticipated cost for cross laminated timber. So this would be kind of an all in. Um, one important note is that something that affects the construction cost or their anticipated construction cost very much is when construction begins. As we know, we've gone through a period of great escalation over the last year. Uh, unfortunately, all the experts in the field think that that will continue. Uh, so we haven't seen sort of the breaking point yet where things kind of turn around or they'll never really turn around but level off. Um, so these two costs were for the 25 million was assuming construction start of March 2021, which we know did not happen. And this 30.8 million was assuming a construction start date of June of 2023, which in fact we are out a little bit past that now with our current um, understanding. So our Schematic design cost estimate, which is the exercise that we just went through um, this month. We had just a reminder, we had two cost estimators, one that the design team hires, one that the town hires. The idea is you put those two together because cost estimates are just a prediction of the future and are um, that, you know, that's it's just essentially opinions about, about what will happen in the future. Having two separate entities look at the um, scope of the project independently come together compare notes um, and what we do is we actually average those together and that gives us what we call a reconciled cost estimate and in the industry that's essentially what everyone considers to be the most reliable method and so our reconciled cost estimate um, is 38.5 million again that's just an average of these two numbers cost estimator number one um, was uh, fennessy they're hired by um, Feingold Alexander, cost estimator number two was Ryder, Levitt, Bucknell, they were hired directly by the town. Again, you can see there's a large discrepancy. We, we average those together and that's where we are assuming that the cost of the project will be in um, when it goes. Craig, you break, you're breaking up, Craig. Um, in the future. You can, Craig. Oh, you can't you, uh, you, my signal now. You, Ooh, you I see my. Craig? Yes, I'm still here. Can you hear All right. me? Yes, I want you to just for a minute, you broke up, you're going to need to repeat, but there's, is there an error on your slide? It said schematic design cost estimates, August of 2023. You are correct, Austin. Um, I should say, read August of 2023. Okay, just so every, no one's confused about it. We're talking yep. about the cost estimation that was just completed in August of 2022. Correct. Uh, All sorry right. about that, and I'll correct That's that okay. before I share the slide. Uh, before I share this presentation with um, Angela for the record. I see. Sean has a question. Sean, 
Craig, do you want questions at the end or as they pop up on each slide? Um, I, I think in general, if there's a question about sort of the material on the slide, then now is a, a good time to talk about it. If it's sort of a, like, what are we gonna do next question? Maybe we'd say that for the end. All right, I'll, I'll ask you and you decide if maybe you're gonna address this, but so the April, 2022 cost estimate that was from fantasy as well, right? Correct. Uh, so do you, is it, is, is it just cost escalation that change between the 30.8 million and the 36 million, which are both fantasy cost estimates? Um, I'm just wondering what is in that six million or I guess five million dollar difference. Um, you know, they weren't done too far apart. What you know, is yep. it some of the design choices that we've made, or you know, what is the big, I guess, within so, that's the same cost estimator that drove that price up? Yep, no, that's a great question, and uh, I think now is the right time to respond to it. So, there's in a way three things that have contributed to it. Part of it was um, in Fennessy's uh, our assumption back in April that the construction of the start of construction would be June of 2023. We essentially uh, extended that out four months between April and now. Mm -hmm. So that has sort of four months of this kind of high escalation. Um, another aspect is that back here in April, certain assumptions were being made about the market. Um, now, the, <laughs> things haven't gotten any better. In fact, they've, they've continued on. So. That's another kind of four months of market understanding, which has also continued to increase. And then the third thing is this April estimate was off of a kind of conceptual level or very early schematic design. And so there are a lot of assumptions that Fennessy made um, that now that we have a full set of schematic design drawings, things are clearer. And so in that clarity, uh, just between his assumptions and what we now understand the design to be, there may also be some increases in um, sort of what he's seeing on the paper. Does that, Sean, does that answer your question, Sean? Yeah, no, that's helpful. I have one other question, but I'll, Christine can go first. Well, actually, Austin's going to go first. Go um, ahead, Austin. <laughs> is it is the five million dollar gap in cost estimations, is that kind of what one expects or is the gap a surprise? I think it's not uncommon for um, that gap to, or that difference to exist. Um, and I think the fact that it's 5 million, such a large number is uncommon. And I think that is largely having to do with the market, um, sort of this, I, I won't, wouldn't say unprecedented time, but um, very unfavorable market. I'm just trying to get a sense, and maybe we'll talk about this more later and Christina and Sean will get in. I'm just trying to get a sense of the reliability. So the $5 million gap doesn't give me a lot of confidence in either estimation. And uh, I think it'll be good to try to look and say, why is fantasy lower and why is the other one higher? because I think we want to have a sense of how reliable these cost estimations really are. So Christine, and then back to Sean. Thank you. Um, so it's that reconciled word that I'm wondering about. I look at the 36 and the 31, and it's an average of the two cost estimates, 2.5, right in the dead middle. Um, is there, you know, isn't there a process of actually going deeper on the reconciling and then rationalizing? Just meaning, should that thirty-eight point five actually be forty million? Uh, you know, um, so sort of like, is there a deeper dive than just an average of the two? Um, sh short answer is we we performed that deeper dive. There was uh, we had a. Uh, a meeting, I think it was, we spent five hours in the meeting, kind of going line by line. Um, and then after the meeting, there was some additional coordination between the two cost estimators, some additional questions and answers. Um, a lot of it comes down to philosophy. So it's in the cost estimator's best interest. Each professional cost estimator is they don't want the eventual price of a project, cost of a project to exceed their estimates. That's even though it's not necessarily always their fault, that makes people feel less confident. And so they always want to be kind of conservative. Um, I will say Fennessy is more, that's cost estimator number one, is more familiar with this project. They've been 
working with Feingold Alexander for a long period of time. However, sometimes um, having another set of eyes coming fresh into the project uh, will reveal some things that maybe the first cost estimator wasn't, um, say, focused on. So, uh, so that's sort of one aspect. Of it. Another aspect is um, escalation. So, and, and we can dive down into the into the cost estimate, but there's millions and do millions of dollars that are in uh, tied up in what the cost estimators think the market is going to do between now and this October 2023 date. Um, there are two primary methods uh, or philosophies. One is that you escalate to the start of construction, the day the general contractor gives you a bid. That's what Fennessy has done. Um, the other is you escalate to the midpoint of construction. Um, and that is because, and that's what um, RLB has done. And the, you know, there's different arguments and thoughts about it. But my understanding, my probably a crude understanding, is that um, the day the general contractor puts in his bid, that person is also escalating to some point in the project during construction. It's not necessarily saying, all right, we're going to, we, they know they're not going to build it all in one day or in one month. They know it's going to take a, a, a year and a half or more. And so they build an escalation. So those are the two theories. And I think that is also contributing to that large delta between the two because mm -hmm. Fennessy has one philosophy and RLB has another. And neither one isn't more right than the other. Uh, it's just that estimating to the, or escalating to the midpoint of construction is a more conservative approach. Okay. Mm. Sean, oh, God. Christine, are you all set? Yeah, just thank you. Thank you. That was good. Yeah, Sean, back, Craig, back, Craig back answered my question, so I'm all okay. set. Alex, you had your hand up? No, I same. I'm good. Okay. All right, Craig. Thank you. All right. So as as uh, I had sort of alluded to before, we have a budget gap. So here is what we have budgeted for construction. Again, that's assuming construction starts in October 2023. Uh, the anticipated cost is that 38.5 million. So now we're looking at a budget gap of say 11 or 12 million dollars. So there are a couple paths forward as we sort of see it. Strategy number one is to reduce the cost of the building. Um, the number one tool that, that designers and OPMs use when they have to get the cost of the building down is usually to reduce the size of the building. Um, NBLC has already allowed a reduction of the size of the program and they have um, taken a hard line, been very clear that they uh, do not think a further reduction in the program or say the size of the building um, is supportable. And their goal is obviously to have a, a, a library that not only suits the needs of the town on opening day, but also for 20 or 30 years afterward. And so that's the perspective they're coming from is they don't think that a smaller library will necessarily um, work 20 or 30 years from now. And so, we, that tool is not available to us. The other mechanism for reducing the cost of a building is um, you know, value engineering, uh, which usually is just reducing a small amount. Um, I'm calling it you know, to, to get a significant cost, uh, a, as much of a cost down as we need or as we can achieve. It's more of aggressive cost cutting. You're no longer saying, um, that carpet's really nice, but maybe we can find one that's a little more affordable. You're, you're, you're making bigger moves. Like we're not going to, and, and we'll talk about some of those ideas in a minute. Uh, you know, we're not, we're going to take down this sort of portion of uh, a structure or, um, like I said, big move. So with working with the cost estimators, we came up with uh, a list that, um, appears we might be able to achieve about a $4 million cost reduction. That still leaves a gap. Here's the math. That leaves a gap of uh, 7.6 million. So budget gap is at 11.6. If we can reduce the hard cost by 4 million, we still have a budget gap. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But some of the challenges to this strategy is that aggressive cost cutting might not give you the building that the community is envisioning. Right. So everyone has seen the drawings, the conceptual drawings, and uh, the perspectives. They, in large part, the community likes that. Um, 
some of these big moves would be things like eliminating sawtooth skylights, eliminating access to the third floor. And this sort of a caveat on this one is the design team is working with their code consultant to determine the, uh, the parameters, if that's possible, um, you know, and still being on the right side of the code. Um, significantly reduce the landscaping costs. This, this one's actually um, a kind of a go-to in the industry, landscaping, you know, adding plants later on after the project is done, if more money becomes available, um, or if there are bid day savings, that's something easy to do. It doesn't affect the design too much, um, but we would be significantly reducing those landscaping costs. And then uh, another one, which I know the town is uh, in general not in favor of, is um, instead of doing the CLT, which has now been baked into this co these cost estimates, we'd be replacing that with structural steel again. Um, another challenge, so again, you can kind of see these are not easy decisions. These are somewhat painful um, things that erode what the, try the town and the library are trying to do. Uh, another issue is that MDLC might not accept some of these cost cutting uh, ideas if they think it compromises the function of the library. So each one of these would sort of have to be reviewed with the MDLC. Some of them, I don't think that would, they would uh, be worried about, such as uh, CLT versus structural steel. I think that is something that they leave up to the designer and the town. But uh, something like eliminating access to the third floor is a discussion we'd have to have with them. And then lastly, to make all these big changes, uh, we'll take time for the design team to physically draw them up and design it. Uh, Great. Oh, I see you've got a hand raise. Paul. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, these four bullet points, are that does that constitute the $4 million or is this on top of already the $4 million that you might have already factored in? Those are the biggest ones that contribute to that $4 million cost Understood. cutting. Understood. Great. Uh, Thank but you. then on the next slide, we have some smaller ones that we can we can look at. But uh, Craig, again, just to be clear, those four things, do they add up to $4 million or are they no. still short of $4 million? Um, those four things don't equal 4 million, but they're great. pretty close. So okay, here's the, yep. you, all right. So here's the, here's the list. And so all of these items, items one through 12, one through 12, um, these are the ideas, the cost cutting or value engineering, value management, right. whatever you want to call right. it. Here's what they, we, we estimate or the estimators think we can save. And then yep. this is a, I can actually click in. This is a dynamic um, spreadsheet. So right. down here, if you accept all of them, we think it'll be about $4 million savings. So that's where we okay. came up $4 million number. So Alex, Alex Lefebvre has a question, Alex. Yeah, this may be a process question in terms of how we do this, but um, some of these um, value engineering ideas um, are going to require either MBLC or some kind of um, accessibility waiver. So are those things, like, are we going to make decisions and then find out whether we can do them? Or are we going to find out in advance? Like, I just kind of procedurally want to understand how it works. So um, that's a great question, Alex. Um, I think the in you're sort of you're you're getting to my my last slide. My last slide is um, we're throwing a lot of information at you guys. So our uh, recommendation would be to to think it over, ask questions offline, um, but then meet again maybe next week if possible um, to start making some decisions. And in that week, you know, if there are things today that you say. Um, you know, that's just, we just can't, we can't do it. We, we're not willing to do it. Then, you know, we can table that or take it off the list. Um, and we've got sort of these categories, accepted, possible, which is where I listed everything right now, rejected, something that's a hard no, or alternates. Because that's the other concept is that some of these could be an alternate. Um, I'll give you an example. And what that means is um, you, we approach a contractor um, with the documents and in the documents they say uh, please give us two prices one where the building is both aircraft and brick and then an alternate price which would be a deduct um, for just all brick um, and so it's, it's some, somewhat small potatoes here thirty thousand dollars but then the then when you get your bids from the contractors it'll say uh, you know x million dollars for aircraft and brick 
and then X million dollars minus whatever savings we can get out of that, maybe 30,000 for Albrick. So we don't necessarily, by, by some things can essentially be pushed off till later. The decision can be pushed off later. Other things, the decision needs to be made now. An example of something where the decision uh, really needs to be made now would be, um, uh, eliminating the elevator and uh, thus eliminating handicapped access to the third floor and thus really not being able to occupy the third floor for its intended uses. Um, that would be a decision that we would need, uh, the building committee would need to give to Feingold Alexander, let's say in the next week or next week, so that they can start modifying the drawings. So I want to talk and Paul Buckelman, I want to draw you into this question that Alex raised. So as I understand it, the Jones Library Building Committee is empowered to make recommendations to the town manager and to the board of trustees of the Jones Library. So I assume that the process would be, but again, here, I'm just making it up. You tell me whether I'm wrong, that the Jones Library Building Committee would deliberate about any changes that it wants to make in the design of the library, these changes are not de minimis. So they're significant enough that I'm wondering whether or not what we should be thinking about is the building committee deliberating and coming up with whatever changes it wants to make in the design of the building. These are significant. And if you will, making a recommendation to the town manager and the, um, and, and the board of trustees. There's a whole nother thing that we're going to be talking about, which is, of course, the gap which remains, uh, even if we were to do this kind of thing. And then if the town manager and the trustees were to accept these changes and say, this is fine, this is, this is great, uh, we would have to go about getting whatever other permissions that we need to get uh, from other committees. But I'm just curious, Paul, whether that's your understanding of the of the of the process uh looking at this level of cuts and redesign if we were to go that route yeah i think it's an iterative process i think this is where the discussion happens with this committee um i think you we might need to talk to mblc and say what what does this look like to you and you know obviously with the designers um but yeah it's, i think you're precisely right this is where the discussion occurs uh, we, you know, look at, it goes to the trustees and to the manager officially. Um, right. And then, you know, I think we, we have that broader discussion. Great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Christine, I thought I saw your hand up earlier. Sorry. Christine, you're muted. Sorry. Um, my question was to Craig about, he was saying some of these need to be decided like this week or next week. But in a way, don't all of these have to be decided on now because we're trying to figure out how to pay for this building? So the way we can um, postpone some of the decisions are that method of um, including an alternate in the construction documents. So I'll give you an example of one that, which would be easy to achieve. Um, and that would be, so we have a couple here for lower cost, lowering the cost of the ceilings. So it's an interior finish. Um, so right now the design includes some compound wood ceilings. Um, another ceiling could be drywall or acoustical ceiling tile, sort of a drop ceiling. That's something that, um, you know, could net, uh, a significant amount of money, 475,000 if the estimators are accurate. Um, but that is one that we don't necessarily need to decide within the next week. That's something that the design team can change out in a couple months, maybe. Ellen, does that, does that uh, sound accurate to you? So I'm just wondering. Just yes, to... does. Sounds accurate. And so, but the big moves at Craig, like the elevator and stair up to that third floor, that's something we would need to know now. Not, not this moment, but shortly. Christine? So I understand how there's flexibility in these items on when they have to be designed. Um, but what I'm asking is like, as the building committee and as looking at this budget, don't we have to sort of decide it, like in this process over the next couple of weeks, 
what is it that's going to get cut and what isn't and what's going to be changed so that we can have a better number that we can pay for. And I think the answer is yes, you'd have to be on board with kind of all these. There may be other cost saving ideas that we don't have up here. And so I think it, it we would benefit from kind of a, a deep dive into this, maybe maybe tonight, but maybe it doesn't have to be tonight, but sometime soon. But yes, in theory, you would have to at least be willing to accept, um, accept these if the market turns out to, um, confirm the cost estimators uh, opinions and, and uh, assumptions. And so you would get to, you know, so let's say there's three of them on here that need to be decided within the next week. Those decisions get made, yes, yes, yes. Feingold Alexander modifies their drawings and brings that forward. But then some of these other ones, maybe the, about the interior finishes, um, those are decisions that the design documents can show, can show the wood but then it, with just a note, it can say alternate number one, um, remove wood and instead provide drywall. And then those, essentially that decision doesn't get made until the end of uh, the design phase or, or once we're going out to, to bid. Does that make sense? So there's some things that you might say, all right, we can live with drywall as a ceiling instead of the wood, but you, we won't necessarily know that that is going to be the case until we get to bid day. So I just want to just come back, Sean, before you get into this notion of we need to decide now. Because I, uh, I think I understand what that means in terms of uh, an October 23 construction date. But there is another part of this, which is even when we do this, we have a significant gap in the financing. That is not going to be resolved now. So I, I think we want to do the work that we can do as a building committee to express what our views are about these potential changes. Uh, but there's a larger discussion that is going to have to go on beyond this committee about um, the, the next part of your presentation. So I, I think that we all, unless I'm really mistaken, that the idea is we want to do whatever work we can do in the building committee and communicate what we want to communicate about these changes. But there's another discussion that's going to take place that is not likely to happen and be resolved now. Sean? Yeah, no, I, I was going to say something on those lines. I think you're right about that. Um, I guess the other, other question I had was, is when's the design subcommittee meeting again? Is it this week or is it next week? We don't, have, we don't have one scheduled right okay. now. We're waiting for this meeting to get direction. I mean, it seems like based on Craig's input, we sort of have to accept all these or know which ones are, maybe with the design subcommittee's feedback, which ones are sort of the, the ones we absolutely cannot accept or the recommendation on that. Um, but again, just to Austin's point, there's another big piece of this. Um, so I'll stop so we can move to that next slide. But may I just say, Sean, again, there's, uh, again, I don't mean to be Panglossian, there's a yes and a no to this. So if the other side of this wasn't, we need to raise 8 million, but we think we can raise 10, then that would impact on what we do about these things. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not saying that there's, that's in the offing or you know I'm gonna write a check tomorrow for it, but um, I think we're engaged in a kind of contingency planning exercise, at least, uh, at least right now. Uh, Craig? Yes. That's a very good, very good point, Austin. It, the, the, the two are interrelated. All right. So strategy number two, increase funding. Um, so capital campaign, originally their goal was 6.6 .6 million. Um, in, in, in talking with Sharon, uh, there's thoughts of increasing that by 8 million to a total of 14.6 million. Um, similarly, the math there is if this is the only strategy we take, 11.6 million, $8 million additional fundraising. We still have a gap, uh, but a much smaller one, 3.6 million. Some of the challenges here, um, you know, increasing funding, we, we've already asked the question of MBLC, can the grant be increased? And the answer is no, that's not how they're set up. That the grant is 13.9 you know, 13 million is the grant and that's it. And that's the, um, there's no flexibility there. 
Um, and then the other challenge that I sort of mentioned already is that the capital campaign, if they, you know, another 8 million is very ambitious, but even that won't kind of close that gap fully, which leads me to my next strategy, which is kind of combination attacking from both sides. Uh, you reduce the cost of the building as much as you can. You raise as much money as you can. Uh, if these things are achieved, and that's a big if, uh, the budget gap could potentially be resolved. So here it is, you know, 11.6, you reduce the cost, you, you, you um, get increased funding, and now you're down to a, um, you're back on budget, essentially. Um, challenges here is, is that, I mentioned this earlier, the, the $4 million cost reduction, it is somewhat of a different building <coughs> than the original concept. And like I said, MBLC effect negatively impact fundraising. So if somebody's like, yeah, I really like those sawtooth skylights, not interested in a building that doesn't have them, um, you know, that, that's a potential. Um, cost reduction is an estimate. Fundraising is a goal. Um, as everyone knows, there's a lot that can happen between now and sort of the, the end of the project. So this 11.6 million, this, that's not a magic number that, okay, we just have to get to that. And, you know, we've made it. Um, things are, it's, a, it's an evolving situation. Things will continue to change. Um, also, these calculations don't factor in soft costs. So this is all just hard costs, the estimate cost, estimated cost for construction of the building and the site. Um, Profession, if there are additional professional fees needed, that's not included. Contingency, uh, we, we're now, we, when you have a, an increase, usually you have a, a, a three to 5% uh, for your construction contingency, three to 5% for your owner's contingency. That's your emergency money. Um, when the project cost goes up, typically your contingency increases proportionally. Um, this $11.6 million does not include an increase in contingency. So now we'd be down a construction contingency of 2.7%, which is not sort of in the range, the recommended range of three to five. And the owner's contingency would be way down at 2%. Same thing, not in that range, the comfortable range of three to 5%. So what that means is uh, we would continue forward with this um, kind of restriction uh, there, it, and, and kind of, um, the opposite of comfort. So sort of this, this diff, discomfort um, with uh, how much money is sort of in, in the wallet. Um, that brings me to the fourth strategy, which is not one that is fun to talk about, but it is an option and that is to back out of the current grant. Um, this is one we've discussed with MBLC and said, all right, what does that look like? So first step is the $2.7 million that has already been received in the first disbursement would have to be returned. Um, the library would then now be without that $13.9 million grant. Um, to get another grant would require re reapplying. Uh, the next round, the good news is the next round of grants is in winter of 2022, so it's not too far into the future. However, MBLC did caution that uh, it is going to be very competitive round. There are already 40 cities and towns that are interested in sort of competing for that money. Um, we don't know if the Jones Library would be um, would, would be a recipient of that next round of grants. Um, there, uh, sort of a note to that is MDLC did indicate that the process is changing a little bit, um, which the, the biggest difference that they mentioned was, I guess, originally the process, you had to come with a program um, as well as a design. Now it is just a program need and a design and in this next round, it'll just be a program in need. And so you don't necessarily have to show up, day, you know, make your application with a design, which I think is um, a good move in general for the MBLC. And then the other big challenge is the project goes on hold, right? So between now and when the grants are announced, um, nothing really moves forward with the design. And that hold could potentially be for years if the Jones Library isn't selected for this next round, then you've got to wait around until another round is announced, apply again, and kind of repeat process until another grant is secured. So not, 
So this is sort of, uh, again, it is an option, but it's not one that is um, relished. Um, and that, so those are sort of the extents of the ideas that we have, certainly open to more ideas and hopefully in our upcoming discussion, we, we can um, think creatively and maybe come up with something else. But um, time is a factor. So here's our current schedule. Um, you can see this is where we are on this red line. Schematic design is complete. And, and if these cost estimates had come back more favorably, we'd be looking for the LBC to, and, and the town to direct Feingold Alexander to immediately proceed on to design development. We're already, say, a week behind that. Uh, um, any time that it takes to sort of get our legs under us and figure out which direction we're going is, as the project pushes off, here's, here's what that might look like. Um, unfortunately, I'm getting a mess. All right, my, my internet's unstable. Can you still hear me? Yeah, off and, off and on, in and out. So far, keep talking. Okay, sorry. So uh, just just the first kind of thing in, in front of us would be, all right, if we make those big design moves, uh, design team estimates, it'll take about six weeks to kind of get that into the drawings, review it again with the MDLC, review it again with the town. Um, that, you know, pushes, you know, the, uh, it's essentially kind of taking a big step back in schematic design. So we would not leave schematic design until we have yeah. a, um, a balanced budget and scope. Um, so it pushes off design all the way through construction, uh, all these red stars, this is our MBLC grants, those are tied to certain milestones in the project, those start getting pushed over, um, yeah. one of them gets, the final one gets pushed from mid-2025 all the way out to July of 2026 mm -hmm. at the earliest, um, which I know poses a, a cash flow problem, um, a potential cash flow problem. So. That leads me to my last slide here, which is that message that time is of the essence. We're throwing a lot of information at you. Take some time, absorb it. Let's talk about let's talk about it. As, as Paul was indicating, you know, uh, continue these discussions, develop a plan, and then perhaps in a week or as soon as possible, uh, meet again to make some of those hard decisions. Thank you, Craig. Ellen. Yeah, I had a quick I had a quick question and uh, Craig, we had talked about it. One option is and it's it it is a risk, but I just wanted to throw this out here because we've done it before, is that we we continue with the design process and get through DD, do another estimate, and then it, it what what we don't and then you we could go to CDs and do another estimate and then if if the fundraising doesn't come up to to speed you shelve the product project Be, and if but if you can if the if the fundraising you know um, fires on all all cylinders and they can make those goals you won't miss a step um, if we delay this you're gonna it's gonna you know Craig's uh, schedule there was very helpful everything start you start you know missing those payments and and that's a financial burden but it would be a risk to the town i i just want to be absolutely clear cuz you would yep. still have you'd have to pay the design fees yeah and at some point Sean, right you've got to decide about when you're going to float bonds yeah there's that and, and i mean tell us point so if we have to return the grants um i assume we also would have to return the fundraising proceeds because those were you know for a new building so you know we'd be the town has to decide how much it's willing to sort of put into this project you know with the possibility of not if we go with that final option that was presented um like how far we're willing to go into it without knowing it's balanced um so that's something we'll have to discuss and and if i may you know so colliers our standard recommendation is that at the end of schematic design whatever it takes you uh, don't proceed until you have a balanced uh, budget and scope um, just okay, as that, a general that makes sense yep. yep so uh ellen your hand is still up are you okay uh so craig for the moment could you take down the 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 sc screen share and then we might want you to bring back the screen share sure. 
So I want to just ask a couple of questions off the top about the impact of these things on the sustainability goals of the library. So the sawtooth roof, you know, the the uh, sawtooth sawtooth roof, and the skylights. Um, the movement from cross laminated timber to uh, steel. Uh, wh what are the likely impacts of those things <clears throat> on the sustainability goals of the library? We had a sustainability committee that worked very hard to produce a design, including cross laminated timber. And I assume that the passive solar on the roof was part of it to produce a very sustainable building. And I wonder whether you or you and Ellen have at all thought about that. And if so, what do you have to say about that? Uh, yes, so we did um, look at that a little bit. And if I may, I'll share my screen again because I have a, a graphic that'll help us. Thank you, great. All right, so um, these four items that are in gray, these are those energy conservation um, methods or measures, yep. lighting controls, HVAC yep. occupancy controls, HVAC demand ventilation controls, and plug load, plug load controls. These are all sustain yep. sustainable moves are still in the project. Great. Um, so and those are baked into those current cost estimates. Yep. Okay. Um, but as you were saying, and I'll, I'll let Ellen speak to the, uh, or Ellen and Josephine speak to the discussion about the um, skylights because there is sort of an idea that we floated uh, or they floated um, earlier this week. One, one thing is we could just do uh, standalone skylights, right? So they're pre-manufactured and they're essentially dropped on the roof. Um, we did have that discussion with MBLC. They like to, they would rather us not do skylights because down the road, if the maintenance is an issue, um, there's leaks. Like I think you will have today. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Josephine. Um, no, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, the skylight is definitely um, a hot topic for MBLC. So it's something that we have to think about. We had floated the idea of maybe not doing several um, monitors, but maybe having a reduction in monitors, but um, depending on the sun and the, um, and the lighting that's coming in, maybe we can have one or two smart ones as opposed to the number that we have now. Um, but we are just floating a lot of ideas around right now. Uh, I raised those because those seem to me to go to uh, kind of one of the values of the project. Um, you know, closing off the third floor, that's a loss in space. It may be, you know, compromise some program elements, but I don't think it goes to what I would call the heart of the project. The, the sustainability goals, I think, are close to the heart of the project. And, and I think we would need to know more than you have said about what the impact would be. I and mean, again, we can revisit, Alex and the sustainability folks can revisit, if you move away from cross laminated timber, what is that going to do uh, to the sustainability goals. The other thing I just want to say before Paul and Alex get in is um, I am very optimistic that uh, the Capital Campaign Committee uh, can significantly increase uh, what it has been imagined. They've had great success already. There are several million dollars in grants that are in the offing that were not originally part of the plan. And that at the trustees meeting on Thursday, I think the trustees are going to have to have a conversation also about um, what, if anything, the trustees can do, the library can do uh, about this $8 million gap. So I just want to just put that an asterisk about that um, as we as we go forward with the conversation. Paul and then Alex. Paul. Yeah, thank you. So first, I, I really appreciate the way you laid this out, Craig. It's really nicely organized and presented. I think everybody in the community can now understand this. Um, and I do agree with you that this is a good stopping point to say, okay, where are we? As you know, you outlined, as, as Austin's outlined, you know, to me, I would not spend a lot of time on the design elements because I think the fundraising piece, if that's a, you know, if Austin, you're right and says that's where we can get the money, I think that the two places, uh, pressure points for me would be 
the, you know, are we able to raise more funds, which I really would really, I mean, grand opportunities are great. We'd like to see that, but the timing of that is pretty critical because those were probably long lead times. Um, and so I, I think that's a, and then also if the MBLC, I know they're sort of very firm on their design, their program guidelines, but every community is going through the same thing. We're having the same issue with the schools and I doubt they will change, but I don't know if they're getting enough if, we, if there's any pressure to be put on them to say we need to adjust our program given these skyrocketing um, you know construction cost estimates and maybe that will modify over time which we, we don't know but um, time, time isn't on our side at this moment you know we we need time we need time to make a decision but we don't have time to make a decision on these things thank you Alex Thanks. Um, I actually just wanted to follow up on two questions, uh, one of yours, Austin, and one of yours, Paul. Um, on the sawtooth roof and skylights, um, my understanding of one of the uses of that was daylighting, which I assume contributes to lowering energy costs. Like we have, like it wouldn't just be removing, I assume, and this is where this is where you need to come in is, you know, would we have to add additional lighting Would our ultimate energy costs be higher? Like, are there long term impacts to taking away that daylighting aside from it just being more pleasurable to have more light in the building? Um, so I would add that to Austin's question. And then this is sort of related to what Paul's saying, but um, and I, no one here may have the answer. But so when I talked with um, our person who works with us from the MBLC, um, the way their process has always worked is that they don't open the next phase of projects until all of the projects that are currently approved have gone through. And so opening in winter of 2022 seems to be a clear change from what their past practices are. And we are one of, Sharon probably knows better than me, number of projects that are in this exact same position. And so I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't know what, I don't know what that means for the MBLC in terms of if they're already looking forward to other projects. Um, but I just put that out there is the next phase wasn't supposed to open for like, you know, it was five to seven years, two years ago, but like they're clearly changing direction on how they've said they're doing things and how they're doing things in the past. And I don't know what that means. I'm just putting it out there as information for when we're dealing with the MBLC. Great. Sharon, Craig, Ellen, do you want to say anything about the conversation with the MBLC? I would love to. Uh, so we, Josephine and I had a conversation with MBLC before we had this formal one with Craig. Um, and we've been working with them for uh, six years or something um, on this particular project it, and other projects. So we know them well. Yep. Um, and they were, they, they were very stern about the reduction of program because they feel as though, well, not feel as though we've cut, we've reduced the program, I think twice already, and they will not do it. So that we wanted to bring Craig into the process since he is the o OPM um, representing the town. And he posed the question to him and uh, Craig, you know, what, what were your thoughts on that? It seemed like it was a hard line that they were not willing to cross. And just to add to what Alex was saying about how they're changing their process, they are absolutely changing their process, um, which is actually better for the towns because you can submit for the grant without a design in hand. You just need your program. So that's a benefit. And I believe they are speeding things up because the state has money. And when the state is when things are bad with the state, they slow the, the gap between grant runs down. So I want to come back. May I just ask you again about the MBLC? So the, the point that was made that Alex and others have made is that this is, a, this is not an Amherst problem. This is a statewide problem. And is their view like they're going to be accommodating to other libraries because no, their view is we don't care whether these projects get built. Uh, we're going to hold the line on what our what our program is. Ellen, you're speaking mutedly. 
Austin, they don't have any more money to give anybody. And as Andrea, who's our content, direct contact, one of our direct contacts there, she was the director of the Woburn Library when it was uh, bid in, when it was estimated in 2008. It was, went out for bid when the economy came back and it was $14 million over. And, and they had to make cost reductions and um, to get the, and, and raise more money to get that project built. And they did. So it, it can happen. And, but on the other hand, there are projects that stop and never get going again because yeah. they can't get funding. Yeah. Okay. Other questions about uh, Craig's presentation? So I, I, I would like you to do uh, me a favor if you could, and if others don't need this, forgive me. Could you bring up the slide about uh, where you looked at the detail of the cost reductions? Yes. Because I think uh, it would be useful for the committee process to go through each one of those lines, to actually understand what is on each one of those lines. Uh, but Alex has a question. So Alex, do you want to ask a question before we do this? Alex? Sorry, yeah. Um, my question was going to be specific to some of those lines. So I so think- let's go address, through it. But also, um, we do have a member of the Sustainability Committee in the audience who has a hand raised. So I just want to put that out to you, Austin. I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't seen it, so, okay. So let's go, Sarah, just hold for a minute if it's okay. Let's go through these lines. Uh, Craig, walk us through what these lines um, are. Certainly. So um, item number one, we've talked about eliminating the sawtooth skylights. Um, cost estimators believe there's a potential half million dollars to be saved if we, and this is to eliminate them and have a flat opaque roof. Okay. Um, one idea is maybe to not go for the full half million, but have, um, say, a smaller skylight centrally located, as Josephine was describing. Um, so yep. there is some flexibility there. The next one, item two, is changing the Aris craft on the exterior to brick. So right now it's a combination of Aris craft base, brick up above. And so this would be, brick is less expensive, so it would be brick and brick. Again, that's not a huge value, okay. $30,000 potentially. Okay. Next one, uh, this is a complex one, but eliminating that elevator and handicap access to the third floor. Yeah. So that would mean you're you're not you're not going to be able to have a meeting room up there, and not even necessarily be able to have staff space up yeah. there. So that would yeah. have to be relocated. So yeah. where is that going to be? Potentially the ground floor. One idea we talked about offline was, and I know this would be a painful one, but to have the art gallery function. Uh, instead of having uh, its own dedicated room, move mm -hmm. that to the conference room. Mm -hmm. And I, again, this this itself could be a whole hour-long discussion or more. Yep. yep. Um, perhaps in the cafe area, perhaps in a corridor, display the art. That you know, we we've seen successful successful examples of that in other venues. Um, but that one's a big one, three hundred thousand dollars savings potentially. Um, item number four: uh, change curtain walls to windows. Um, not a big dollar item, um, it would change the look of the building significantly, but it is something that instead of having curtain wall, which is somewhat of a premium, you'd have uh, large windows, but again, a different look. Um, this one, I don't even know if it would be allowed according to, in accordance with the historical societies, um, item five, standing seam metal roof in lieu of slate tiles. Mm -hmm. So right now there is a uh, $400,000 or so in the uh, cost estimate to replace the existing slate tile roof with new slate tiles. Um, this would be a change to standing metal roof, standing seam metal roof. Okay. Um, item number six, decorative mailing, a decorative metal railing in lieu of glass. Right now, uh, the interior, uh, some of the railings are uh, glass. It's a very uh, cool, modern look. Uh, metal railings are less expensive uh, to the tune of $120,000. Lower the cost of the ceilings by uh, mm -hmm. eliminating the compound or replacing the compound wood ceilings with drywall or ceiling tiles. Uh, pretty good uh, chunk of money there, $475,000. But again, that does have a, a significant impact on sort of interior space. In addition to that, you could um, 
replace the plank ceilings, which are these long um, sections uh, with two by two lay-in ceiling, not as nice, $50,000 potential savings. Okay. Item number nine is reduce the landscaping. And this would be kind of across the board. You'd be doing yep. concrete in lieu of stone or granite pavo pavers mm -hmm. or even asphalt instead of stone or granite pavers. <clears throat> So you'd still have hard walking surfaces, but a different different character. Eliminate the rain gardens, um, significantly cut back on the number of plantings, both trees, shrubs, um, flower beds, $495,000. And again, that's one that uh, if money were available later, those items could be added back in or swapped back in. This is one um, that is probably gonna be news to George uh, and probably not welcome news, but item number 10, um, we have uh, an enclosed um, sort of trash recycling area um, doing a three-sided CMU structure with maybe a gate on it uh, could save $65,000. Again, not big, not a big number. Here's a big number replacing the CLT with structural steel, but understanding that that is not one that uh, the town is uh, would relish. And then item 12, this has to do more of back house, back of house things. Um, reducing the HVAC and electrical systems, uh, changing them to be uh, less expensive, um, still code compliant, still very comfortable, uh, but this one potentially a million dollar in savings. Uh, and that's one that uh, at this time, because those systems are just exist in narrative, would be an easy change and uh, a potentially lucrative one. But um, Again, that's just an estimate. So we would have to see if that bears out. And then we listed off, then the rest of them are just these, um, the uh, energy conservation measures. And so we listed off the ones that are not currently in and the ones that are in. So adding the attic insulation would not be in. Um, adding insulation to the existing walls would not be in. Uh, having triple pane windows would not be in. Um, high performance glazing, which I think is an option to this number four, would not be in. Window overhangs would not be in. Lighting controls, yes, are baked into the cost estimate. Geothermal heating is not in. That was a big ticket item, over a million dollars. HVAC occupancy controls is in. HVAC demand ventilation controls is in. And plug load controls are in. Uh, photovoltaic panels or solar panels are not in. And the total of the savings is uh, that $4 million. Uh, and then to execute these other energy um, conservation methods or measures would be somewhere around $3.4 million, which is you know not factored in at, at present. So we have Meaning, those four measures included, yep. nothing else. Right. But uh, I just want to understand this, Craig. So if if we did the cuts to four million and left those other things out, would the savings be seven million? Is that what you're saying? Nope. No, I'm sorry if it, it, it is. I, the way I presented, it, I was trying to capture everything in, in the anticipation that um, we would you would want to know about where these yeah. things landed. But yeah, it does make this a little more complicated than it needs to be. Essentially, um, to have these four energy saving measures yep. does not increase the cost any more than we already have. Um, you would have to cut all of these items up here to yep. see that $4 million savings. Yep. And these other ECMs would kind of undermine that or reverse that. Okay. And in other words, you'd be adding in the cost. So we'd be adding $3 million of cost. Okay. So we've got Sean and then Alex. Sean? Craig, the HVAC um, reduction. Do you know if that has any impact on the CPA project for the special collections? With um, so we've got the million dollar CPA um, funding. I don't know if you know if that's detailed enough to know if that would have any impact on that project or that part I, of the build project. Um, Ellen and Josephine, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that this would be for the library at large and not necessarily special collections. Special collections uh, system remains as originally designed. <laughs> Yes, I believe that's the yes. But my question to you, Craig, my understanding was that million dollar savings was the was the delta between what Fennessy was carrying and, and the town's estimator was carrying. I thought that's what that number was. 
that's also what I, I thought it was for a right. system um, that it's priced at about 70, 75 a square foot. And I think it was the Delta, if I remember correctly, but the special collections back to Sean's question, um, it does not um, impact any of the special collection and CPA grant. Craig, do you have an answer for about this million dollars now? I do not only that it was um, reducing the, the square footage cost um, for HAC, I think right now, and maybe it was a, the um, RLB estimate was up uh -huh. higher on 80 or $90 a square foot, uh, getting it down to 65 to $70 a square foot. Um, uh -huh. and I, I thought, and maybe I was wrong, I thought that was a change of system. I thought that was going to a VRF system, which is not what was currently designed. No, I, I, but I think I think Josephine and I are correct. It was that gap between okay. the two, and um, it was a middle ground. Okay. Looking at the reconciliation, um, they're from what I got back from them. The most recent, there was not. There's only a couple hundred thousand dollar gap okay. after the reconciliation. Okay. So this would be a little of both from that. Okay. All right. I got Alex and then I got Christine and um, and then we'll see whether or not a couple of members of the public can contribute to our understanding here. Alex. Thanks. So I just wanted to clarify um, in terms of the chart that we have here, um, just so we're looking at accurate things. The only um, ECMs that the sustainability committee asked to be considered during design development are ECM four and six, triple pane window glazing and window overhang. Uh-huh. I, there's there's some number like the geothermal we axed our so there's only two that should be in that alternate category that aren't in gray just when you update that chart yep um, should only be four and six ECM four and six and then also um, I noticed that the cost of the ECMs are the same cost from the estimate that was done whenever the first estimate was done so these don't look like they are updated estimates so. For any of the ECMs, so I don't know whether just there hasn't been movement in these particular things. They're small enough, but I just again want to make sure we're all dealing with realistic numbers. That's actually a great point, Alex. And, and these are this is information from October of 2020. Um, right. Just going through this process, we realized that we never <laughs> we never got a proposal or um, revised numbers in 2022. Um, so that is that was an, an effort that I, I know you guys had asked for, and then um, just yesterday realized we never got them. Um, yeah. So, so I apologize for that. All right, Christine. Um, so, not two quick questions. One building on what was just said. So, in the estimates, the two estimates were they working off these numbers, or were they knowledgeable enough to be looking at these items and know? what their true cost is, our current cost, our escalated cost is gonna be. Um, and the other part is, you know, seeing all these sustainability issues, uh, elements removed, will that knock us out of the Eversource uh, money that we were hoping for? Because I know that seemed to be where it, it builds, you get more by doing more. Um, uh, to answer your first question, Christine, just to clarify, are we, were you talking about this this top area? Of no, the bottom. Oh, well, uh, the bottom, a lot of these sustain, the ones that you were just highlighting and talking about that Alex brought up, that they had. Right. Since so, so it sounds like the two that are really um, under consideration are these in yellow. And uh, these are this is old information. So it's not escalated to, to, to current day dollars, um, unfortunately. And then the, the second part of your question uh, was about Eversource and their rebates. Um, and I, I guess I don't know, and I don't, maybe Josephine or Ellen know, but also possibly not, because we haven't gone very far with um, developing those designs. But um, I do not know if we would be in jeopardy of not being eligible for the, is it Eversource or National Grid? I can't recall. We can ask the engineers. I don't know that offhand. 
but we'll th that's a good question christine will definitely check up on that sharon yeah, so it is Eversource, and those it's based on uh, the EUI. So, I, so I think the question that Christine is asking is if we get rid of uh, ECM four and six, does that affect our EUI? I I would have to defer to Ellen and Josephine. I imagine it would, but I don't know to what extent. Josephine? For ECM four and six, um, there is, a, we have a, a ch last chart that we shared with everyone had the EUI um, number that was um, categorized with the ECM. So we would just have to go back to look at that. Okay, Alex? Alex, Alex might remember. <laughs> yeah, so four, thanks. Four and six were things we wanted to look at that would have further reduced our EUI by another 1.06. So the EUI that we presented to Eversource is with the ECMs that are listed in gray. So if we keep, I don't know how, you mm -hmm. know, the daylighting and the CLT, input, you know, mm -hmm. like I, so four and six don't play in here. I, it's just, okay. those were the ones, those were the only ones that should be in the alternate category. The rest of them should be removed. That was my, that was my, what my comment was. Thank you. So I think uh, if it, no one has an objection we have a couple of members of the public who've been involved in the sustainability effort. And uh, I think it would be useful uh, if it's okay to hear from uh, first from Sarah and then from Chris Riddle. But I just wanna make sure there's, are there any objections to that at this point? Okay, so Sarah Draper, Sarah. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Amazing. So. I have a bunch of things. I'm going to kind of say them all at once so I can get them on the record and into the ears of people who will make decisions. Um, I guess the, the, the big takeaway for me here is if we have this decision to make about what to do with the project, the information that I would need and that I would be interested in from a sustainability perspective is what is the impact of any of these proposed changes on the energy model? And that would mean updating the energy model to show, mm -hmm. you know, based mm -hmm. on removing some of this daylighting, what does that do to the energy model? Without yeah. that information, we're kind of flying blind. Okay. Um, and then the other piece is updating the embodied carbon calculations yeah. or like carbon footprint calculations. Because again, the CLT we know is a huge piece of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for me, from a sustainability perspective, like what the specific materials are, aesthetically will make a difference. And there are people that care about that. I am most interested in like, what is the carbon impact? And if there are other design changes that can be made that can keep us at the carbon footprint that we were talking about, whether it's an insulation change or something, like those are options too. Like this, I don't want to get too caught up in like, what are the specific materials? I think we really need to know is what is the carbon impact? And those are numbers that we, you know, the design team can hopefully I don't know how easy it is to get those or how easy it is to update now that you have it um, as a schematic design, but like that's the information I would need to know. Great, great. Um, I guess one other thing to ask is just a question of those HVAC, the modified HVAC design for that lower cost per square foot is again, like what's the energy impact of that? Is it right. like just a less efficient model or does it mean it's gonna be a little bit less easy to control? Just like, what does that mean? Great, okay, thank you. Sarah, good good questions, and we'll get your answers. Chris Riddle. Uh, hello, thanks. I'm uh, I am on the eastern part of the country at vacation here, so you might and it's there's thunder and lightning happening, so you might not be able to hear me. Interrupt. I might get interrupted. I, I'd like to uh, thank. Uh, uh, but I really agree with every word that Sarah said there. And, uh, we really are trying to. We're walking, make trying to make decisions, and without the data. Oh, come on, quiet down, please. Sorry, sorry about that, grandkids. Um, I want to concentrate on the uh, geothermal, which I prefer to call ground source heat pump system. Um, I'm not. Uh, if 
if we're going to take that million uh, million dollars for that and apply it towards HVAC, then we're talking about a VRF system. I want to confirm if that that is so. It's, um, it is not uh, something that, well, I happen to be involved uh, in being a fly on the wall with the high school project, the, the elementary school project. And it is clear to um, the people on that committee that there is almost zero uh, delta in the cost of uh, uh, actually the um, the Eversource contribution, and and you consider the life cycle cost. And basically, the life cycle cost for the additional life cycle cost from geothermal over uh, air source is zero as far as the um, the analysis con con contributed by now by the architects and the OPM at the uh, at the elementary school project. And also, there's also an environmental, main, big time environmental hazard, a relatively a negative environmental hazard of um, air, of a VRF system, air source heat pump system, which has to do with um, the amount of refrigerant used and the leakage of refrigerant in the atmosphere, both of which would be uh, great, grossly lessened with uh, ground source heat pumps. That's my message. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for joining. Thanks, thank, thanks for joining us. So, um, Craig, you, you heard those questions. Uh, Ellen, you heard those questions. Uh, I assume you'll be able to get us some answers to those questions. And Justine, can you chime in just for the ECMs and the energy model? I mean, that, that takes time to get, correct? Right. Yeah. Well, so the whole process would be that we would have to make all the updates to the model before the energy modeler can look into this and do a, an updated energy model. And the tally is, you know, um, part of that. The, mod, the yeah. base model has to be updated with these design changes for us to move forward with any of that. Right. Okay. So uh, hold off on that for one set. Oh, Alex. This is something separate. So if you want to finish this conversation, I can hold my comment. Uh, well, this is what I was going to say. Let's we, we've collected those comments. Are there other comments on the the this slide in front of us? Are there yeah. other things that people want to say or they want to they want information about it? So let's get that. Then I would like to spend some time, at least for a minute, uh, talking with Paul and Sean and this committee about uh, the rest of it, <laughs> the, the other $8 million. Because I do think that uh, we need to, in a preliminary way, um, you know, just have a sense of what, what everybody's thinking is about the that other piece. So Alex, and then uh, again, comments, things we wanna find out about this chart. Alex, and then Sean. Yeah, I just wanted to pop up when we're making the list of, of things that we're considering. Um, so the landscaping, which seems like low hanging fruit, I just wanna point out that we have a historic preservation restriction, which applies to our landscaping and has to be approved by um, the local historic commission. So just, Again, procedurally, in terms of you know whether it's MBLC, Historic Commission, you know Accessibility Advisory Board, whatever, all of these may or may not. We, I guess we just need to identify what they are so we part of the conversation. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, um, I was going to ask um, Craig and Alan. Do you, do you think there's a lot more than this, or I mean, this seems like a uh, based on what Craig said earlier, this is sort of aggressive cost cutting. But he also said it was sort of a preliminary um, sort of brainstorming session. Um, do you think there's much more that could be uncovered uh, based on your experience with other projects in terms of cost saving ideas? Um, or do you think anything else we you know identify is going to be really small? Are these all the pretty much all the big ones that are available? Craig, I'll go first and then you can go. Um, I think um, there's not much else, Sean, on the interior of this building that we can do or on the exterior because we were pushing the idea of, and I know most people hated metal panel, but you know, we were told by both uh, cost estimators that brick is the cheapest exterior material. So we've got that in the budget. Um, so, and, and that's 
that seems to be the way we should go. One thing that I've been thinking about just sitting here and Josephine's going to check is what program elements are not funded by the MBLC grant? And I don't know, Sharon, you may rattle them off, but I can't remember. Um, so that so if they don't care about parts of the building, they're they're not funding. So that might be an opportunity to shrink the building a tiny bit. I mean, you know, as Craig started this conversation, that's where that's usually our go to. We take square footage off, but we're so limited here. We could, you know, maybe think about the things that they're not covering. Um, that it could be something we could consider to uh, shrink the footprint. Sharon, could you just uh, speak to that uh, particular issue before Christine gets in? I could, but I don't wanna. Um, thanks, Alan. Yeah, so as, as Craig had said before, so the Burnett Art Gallery, the Civil War tablet space, special collections exhibit space, they don't, none of those are eligible costs. Um, they don't consider art galleries, exhibit spaces, museum spaces as pure library uh, spaces. Um, and I'm also, I'm not sure if ESL would fall into that. Those are the things that are coming to my head for now. Do they care about things like replacing the furnishings? I, I don't think so. They, they've always said that their focus is on functionality, not whether or not something is pretty. Do they care about replacing shelving? Uh, not as long as it's safe and sturdy. So is there another place where one could say, um, we would look at the, uh, the furnishings, the shelving, uh, and would there be cost savings associated with that? I would say so, definitely, yeah. One thing, one thing um, Austin, we've been down this road a few times on different libraries. Yeah. Reusing your existing furniture as is yeah. saves money. When you start refinishing it or yeah. refinishing the shelving, that's where you don't, it's, it ends up to be a wash. So, yeah. but if the idea is just to keep what you have for now and phase in new stuff as you can afford it for furniture, yes, that's a cost savings. Well, that's what I was thinking about. I was thinking about, I don't know, you can do that with shelving exactly, but, um, but yeah, that's, I was just trying to add some other possibilities uh, along the lines of not something that the MBLC would particularly care about. Christine. Another piece of the puzzle, I'm sorry to interrupt, ahead, Christine. It, uh, another soft cost are, are the, you know, uh, the IT costs. So we've got two and a half million set aside for FF and E and, and the IT is a piece of that puzzle. So um, the more we save on FF and E, the more that can go towards the construction costs. We do have a separate JCPC um, technology IT budget. So, um, there are savings there. There might be some additional savings if um, if we wanted to to go further than the four million if we were to accept that. Christine. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at significant millions here, um, and you know it's great to talk about furniture and shelving, but in the big scheme of things, that's really small. And the only way you make big cuts is square footage. Um, and even though we're hearing the MBLC won't let us, I'm interested in Ellen's comments there about looking at some of these areas uh, from a different lens. And I'm looking at the, from the 2016, the space needs table um, that broke down all the space. I, I know it's probably a bit of work, but I would think we need that information of what is not, um, required by the MBLC in programming, just to at least use as something to consider. I, I know the whole thought of museum space or galleries is painful, but I think we really do have to at least get the information on everything. Great. Okay. So other questions about this, Sarah Draper, I don't know whether you are, have a new question or you just didn't lower your hand. I have a new question comment all right can you just hold off for one second yep so any other questions about this uh this 
slide that's in front of us. Again, Christine, are your, is your hand new or old? It's new. I, I just wanted to confirm, is there someone who can get that information on what areas of our library are not MBC, um, MBLC um, required? I think the library director is. Yeah, I can do that. Th Great. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, Sarah, do you have a question about this chart? Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, it was just one more question or thing to know or thing to ask about the the landscaping piece and the rain gardens. I don't know if those rain gardens were purely decorative or anticipated to do some kind of water management on site. And if they were anticipated to do some kind of water management, what is the cost of doing that in a different way? Um, right. Great, great. Um, actually, I think um, Ellen and Josephine would be best um, most knowledgeable in answering that. We can check the, if, if it is water, you know, if it's water retention, that's usually the cheapest way to go because those, those chambers that you have to install, they're quite expensive, but we'll check. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, we've spent as we should a lot of time on the 4 million. Uh, I, I just want to get a sense, and Paul and Sean, you know, I know it's there's n nothing definitive that one can say, but I think it would be useful to for us to talk a little bit about what would the town's attitude be towards a pledge of additional fundraising. So I'll go first and then Sean can weigh in. Um, Thanks. So unfortunately, this is not unfamiliar territory because we're looking at this for all of our capital projects. Yep. These kinds of really challenging, difficult decisions are very real. I think the um, concept of, I mean, I think we have to look at the big picture like you're sort of driving to um, Austin and say, are we going to get, before we start talking about the smaller sort of tweaks that we could possibly make, can we get within spit and distance of each other in terms of the revenue side of things? It sounds like the MBLC is not going to change, which is an important piece of it. I think it's, uh, you know, the footprint, the, the square footage is an important thing. And we have to look at what's required based on different funding sources and what's optional. In terms of pledging, you know, we'd have to see some evidence that that's a real, I mean, what, what has happened with the pledge so far is that the trustees have backed it up with your 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 endowment. So I, th I think that's the question for the trustees. Are you willing to backstop any kind of fundraising? Uh, and I think that would be the max of the fundraising, whatever the um, trustees are willing to backstop it with. Sean? Yeah, I mean, I think I would just add to it, how likely is it that, um, you know, whatever the new pledge is can be met? And then what is, how are we protecting that? Is there a risk or contingency planning if it's not met and what is that? Um, and we'd wanna be careful that anything that we use as sort of contingency um, doesn't affect future operations, uh, operating budgets or of, you know, either the library or the town. So, um, so, you know, I agree that that's not really this committee's decision. I, we, I think our decision is on the appearance of the building. Um, the funding piece, I think is a town manager, finance director, library, director and, and trustees discussion with the council um, about how we can close that gap. Yeah, uh, well, that's very helpful because I think um, apropos of, we need to decide uh, with all deliberate speed that uh, we need to, to kind of know what it is that's gonna work for the town. And we need to know obviously what it's gonna work for the trustees because until we, know that then the conversation about do we replace CLT with uh, steel beams is uh, it's an interesting conversation but if we're not going to be able to resolve the the, the eight million dollars that Craig shows in his chart then we're not going to be able to resolve it and that conversation about CLT and steel beams is going to be I think um, uh, it's not it's not it's not going to it's not going to get us across the finish line. And um, I do want to say for anybody that's out there that um, 
I think that uh, the Board of Trustees of the Library will uh, begin to have this conversation on Thursday about from the point of view of the trustees. But I do think, uh, and I'll leave this to Paul and Sean and Sharon, I do think that as much clarity from the town in advance of that meeting as you can provide, and you may not be able to provide any more than you have, uh, will be helpful so that we can have a, a discussion that's that isn't merely abstract and, uh, and hyp hypothetical. What date did you say that trustees meeting was, Austin? Uh, it's Thursday, isn't it, Sharon? Yeah, it's Thursday. So it's again, Thursday. If, if, if Sharon, if you guys can uh, get your heads together sometime between now and Thursday, I'm sorry to ask you to do that. I think that would be, um, that, that'd be helpful because it does seem to me that there's a threshold question. And that threshold question is, can the town and the trustees come to a position of comfort, if that's the right word, uh, on, this, on this fundraising gap? Uh, and if we can, then uh, I think, uh, then we're gonna face these hard questions about you know, this or that in the, in the, in the design. Uh, and I'm optimistic that we'll be able to, but. Um, so just but, kind of quick response to that, Austin. Sure. By um, optimism, you want to rain on the parade? No, no, no. It's, it's more of just, um, just think about process. And again, maybe this yeah. is an offline conversation, but just, um, again, we would need to see information from the group that's raising the funds. Again, how, what the plan is, how the timing of it, the, um, Again, we would need a plan that we could evaluate and determine if the town is comfortable with that plan. Um, so Paul and I can talk about it, but you know we don't have much to go on until we see sort of more specifics and details about how that would happen. Well, yeah, I mean, but um, there, there are different conversations, right? There's conversations about the fundraising and then there's conversations about the backstopping. Mm -hmm. And I take it, I say this with love, that the town doesn't care whether it's money comes whether the money comes from the library in some way or from fundraising so long as the library's contribution doesn't doesn't compromise the operation of the library so correct uh in in any case i i hope that whatever conversation can be had can be um can be had and again just to keep the complexities in mind as i think craig's presentation suggests um We've got to be aware of whatever, even if we could get to a comfort level with that, we've got to be aware that whatever changes we make in the building may have implications for fundraising and other, and, and other things. But that's a contingency on a contingency. Christine. Um, I agree with um, Sean that, but as a building uh, committee member, I would like to see that is we're trying to make these hard decisions. I would want to hear what the plan or assurances from the fundraising people, how they would think that they could increase 6.6 .6 million, another 8 million. I, I would want to know that. Um, just back to the meeting. You said it's on Thursday. What time? And is the public able to watch it? Can I watch it? Is it online? How, or is it a private meeting? I don't think we're allowed to have private meetings. And, I, or is it in person? I don't know what's going on. I don't, yeah. So the trustees meeting, Sharon will, will answer the trustees meeting, will be online on Zoom. Correct. Uh, you can go to the town's website to, to get the Zoom link. 4.30. For, and thank you very members, much. members of the public are invited to attend in the usual, in the usual course of things. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Craig and Josephine and Ellen at this point? Okay, before you, before you do this, if it's okay, again, there are mem other members of the public, I want to invite them to ask their questions just uh, or make their comments so that Ellen and Josephine can also hear them if that's okay. So if there's any member of the public that wants to make a comment or ask, Alex, are you raising your hand? I am, the meeting's at four, not 4.30 on Thursday. Uh, is there any member of the public that wishes to speak? I see one member of the public, Ginny Hamilton.
Jenny, are you there? So we're not we're not hearing you, Jenny. I have asked her to unmute. Okay, so let's see whether or not we can fix Ginny's um, Ginny's issue, and then we'll get Ginny back in. So. Uh, before going back to Sean about um, the financial update, uh, Colliers, do you have anything else that you need us to hear? Specific to um, so the, the cost estimates? No, um, that's everything I've got. However, I do have sort of the typical reports, if you would like uh, me to go through those. Uh, you, what reports do you have? Let's see here. So we've got, um, so you, we've already seen the schedule. Yep. Um, I have uh, the, there's not a whole lot of information on it, but I have the financial status report. If you'd like me to show that, just shows the invoices that we've received, or we can table that to either the next meeting or um, next month. Sean, are you okay with laying it over or you want to see it now? I would table it. I think, you know, we okay. just, I think the first piece was sort of the big financial status yep. reports. Yep. Anything else, Craig? Uh, the last thing was, uh, you know, on the agenda is interim locations. Um, and I don't know that we necessarily, same thing, maybe we table that until we have the Great. bigger discussion. Great. Okay. So, Ginny, are you able to speak? Okay, so again, we'll try to work with Ginny, right, Sharon? Sean, so financial only, update. Yeah, the only thing I have, which sort of salt in the wound, but I do have an invoice for us to um, approve. So I'll just quickly share my screen. Thank you. Um, this is Collier's invoice for work through July. Um, same as before, uh, the monthly fee is consistent. Um, so there's not too much more to say about this unless Craig wants to comment i don't have anything else to add okay. i think it just, these will just keep coming out <laughs> yep ellen yeah i and sean maybe we have to get together Are, we still don't have a contract because we were asked to get some other um uh consultant on board uh so we can't get paid so uh, i think we need to table us getting those other consultants on because okay. we've been working on this for months. Okay, so just hold line one second, Ellen, on that. So let's let's resolve the invoice. Move to approve the invoice as presented. Oh, Thank I'm you. sorry. That's okay. Is there a second? Second. second. Thanks. Uh, so again, I'm just going to ask you vocally: Do you approve the payment of the invoice, Christine? Yes. George. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Yes. Sharon. Yes. Sean. Yes. Alex. Yes. Austin. Okay. So we approved uh, the payment of the invoice. Uh, I, I, I was just a loss a little around the bend, Ellen. Um, so there's some problem with the, the contract, which right. was. It's not the con. Well, we, Sean and his team asked us to go out and get other consultants, like yep. it was AV and, and FF &E, which we came back with an FF &E cost reduction, which I, I think is a good thing. Um, and then, so it's, we still don't have an AV because we don't know the scope of it yet. So I would like to, I don't know how we, I don't know what we do, Sean, for us to continue down this road of not being able to invoice because we don't have the scope for the AV and we don't uh, have a signed contract. I think we need to work that out sooner than later. Yeah, no, I agree. I think Craig, last time we spoke about this, we might be at the point where we just do the, Get the contract signed for the base service, um, and then you know anything else potentially would be an amendment to that contract or added on to that contract. But um, we, I think, this committee and and the town manager have already seen sort of the base service contract, and we're agreeable to that. So um, okay. we were just working on getting some of the other specialties within the the, the budget for the project. 
And we're fine doing amendments, Sean. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll leave that to Ellen and Sean uh, to work out. Ginny, are you able to speak? So we're not able to hear. So um, I, I think we're going to keep going and in the hope that uh, time will resolve this problem. So I don't know that we have subcommittee reports from design. We have not met since the last meeting. Um, right. And my, I'm hearing that we're probably going to meet next Tuesday. And I don't, I'm not seeing a reason why the design meeting uh, needs to happen on Friday. Please tell me, Sharon. Or anyone. Yeah, I think probably we, we're going to try to get together next um, next week, we don't need a design committee meeting between now and then. Um, and then Alex from Outreach. Yeah, we haven't had a meeting as well. Um, so we did do the two exterior tours, um, but we haven't had a meeting. Great. Okay, well, thank you. Um, can we just, uh, Craig made a proposal, but I think we need to, Craig suggests that we meet next week. And I just want to raise the question of um, will we will we have anything new to say next week? Well, that that got a lot of response. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is I wonder whether we want to proceed along two tracks. I think we should proceed along two tracks. One is to actually keep talking about these design changes, and the other is to carry on the conversation with the town and the trustees about the about the, the, the financing. And if you are amenable to that, then I think we should we should meet again next week and hear some of the answers to the questions that were raised about the sustainability um, questions and other questions. Are you, are you good with that? Okay, so are, you, are are we able to meet a week from today? That would be on the 16th at 4.30. I can't meet next week, but it doesn't mean you all can't meet without me. No, I think we, I think we need your present, Sharon. Um, yeah, I'm on vacation next week. Okay, so uh, Sharon, let's get our heads together about scheduling the next the, the next meeting. Figure out when everybody's when everybody's when everybody's back. Okay. Ginny, are you able to speak? She's telling she's texting me. She says she's on vacation and she apologizes for the lack of a working connection. Okay. Well, tell her we appreciate, well, I guess she can hear, we appreciate her attendance and we'll look forward to, uh, you know, if she has something that she'd like to address, she can write a letter or write a communication. Okay. I know of no correspondence that we need to address. Uh, other, than, other than what we've talked about this meeting, I know about nothing that wasn't anticipated 48 hours in advance. So I think we don't have anything there. We've, I've asked for public comment. Uh, anyone, other members of the public? Okay. Well, I wanna second what was said on behalf of everybody about Craig's presentation. I wanna thank you for being thorough, calm, and um, really very clear in what you've laid out for us. I think it's it's a tremendous contribution to the work of the committee and to the town and the and the trustees. So thank you very much for that. Thanks to you and um, and and Will. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to adjourn and you will hear about a proposed uh, meeting date um, in 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 due course. Thank you, everybody. Stay well. Thank you. Good night.